contemporary art studios coming at you live, documenting and exhibitions. We're starting off with Philip Gust in a solo exhibition at the Tate Modern. And we're looking forward to showing that. I'm Michael Wellen, Senior Curator, International Art. And hi, I'm Michael Raymond, Assistant Curator of International Art. We're the co-curators of this exhibition and we'll be guiding you around Philip Guston's work with the help of those who knew him and those who admire his art. Including the writer Olivia Lang. He's somebody who's continually in search of freedom. The constant drive to reinvent and it's very high stakes, that process. The art historian and curator Andrea Emalife. One of the reasons why I've always loved Guston's work is that there's so many different threads within it. The artist, Charles Gaines. He still represents a whole idea about abstraction, even, even into his figurative period. Tate Paintings conservator, Anna Cooper. One of the things that's interesting about him is that he uses quite a limited palette of colors, but he can create an amazing variety of tones and depths of shade that you only can appreciate when you look really closely. Illustrator and artist, Black Moody Boy. I think the role of the artist in tackling social issues is actually a responsibility. It actually comes with the trade. Restaurateur and family friend of Gustin's, Ruth Rogers. Drop dead handsome, incredibly. You can see in the photographs what you call a big man. And um, he was fun, you know. And Gustin's daughter, Musa Mayer. Even though there are stories being told in his paintings, they're open to many interpretations. They have the kind of resonance that really good poetry has. Come the wall to the easel. We look at Philip Gustin in his formative years. It was a time of difficulty and transformation for the young artist. He responded to the problems that he was facing in his life with art. As a kid, he'd go in the closet with a bare light bulb to draw. The image of the light bulb recurs throughout his work. It was also the beginning of his political awakening. And he looked for ways to engage in left-wing politics and to combat racial injustice through art as well. Gustin was Jewish, and his family had migrated from what is present-day Ukraine through Canada to the US. And there in the US, he saw rising anti-Semitic and anti-immigrant and anti-black sentiment across the country. Hate groups like the Ku Klux Klan were gaining visibility. They had millions of members at the time. And Gustin and his friends, who he'd met in high school, got involved in making murals in order to raise awareness about the violence that the group was committing against black Americans, against Jews, against basically anyone who didn't fit their white supremacist ideas of what the US should be. In this gallery, you'll notice a stark difference from what you've come across up until now. Gusson was facing something of a crisis in the late 1940s as he was struggling between two competing tendencies, whether to paint figuratively. This is purchased by the Tate in 1991, this piece. Named untitled income paper. Whether to move in a more abstract direction. And it was at the height of this moment that he was awarded a fellowship at the American Academy in Rome in 1948. Towards the end of his trip in Italy, he traveled more widely across Europe to places like Venice and Paris and Madrid. And it was through seeing art in these places that really inspired him to paint again. And so in 1949, he returns to New York and one of the first paintings he makes is white painting one, which you can see in this room. Here he really changes his technique. He's not stepping back from the canvas uh, to consider what he's painting. He's painting it all in, in one go, close up. I think the curator Harry Cooper summed this change up well in saying that if the 1940s was about Guston learning what to paint, the 1950s were about Guston discovering how to paint. For the rest of the decade, he becomes known for these shimmering abstract works, which drew comparison with Monet's late water lily paintings. And this earned Gustin the label of being an abstract impressionist, which was a comparison that Gustin himself rejected. In 
If the paintings in the previous room from the mid-1950s were dominated by reds, here in the later 1950s we can really see blues coming to the fore. This was a very creatively fertile and also professionally fruitful time for Guston. Guston became really embedded within the New York scene of painters, the abstract expressionists, or the New York school if you like. Painters such as Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, Willem de Kooning, and Franz Klein. At this time, he became represented by Sidney Janis Gallery and started to make steady sales. His works were shown in exhibitions across the US and Europe, including at Tate Gallery for the first time in 1956. In 1960, Gusson was selected for the American Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, and all of this culminated in a huge retrospective at the Guggenheim Museum in New York in 1962, which you can see an image of in this room. All of this helped to really cement his position as one of America's leading abstract painters. We spoke to Gusson's daughter, Musa, about what it was like for Gusson to live in New York at this time. New York was where his contemporaries and friends were working. First on 10th Street, where they actually had studios close by one another and were in and out of each other's studios. And then later, the gathering place was um, the Cedar Street Tavern, known as the Cedar Bar. And there are wonderful photographs of them in intense conversations. My father, despite his isolation in working, was incredibly gregarious, articulate, well-read, and with the right partner would want to talk and drink and smoke all night. So I think that social environment was very generative, but it was also very seductive. It took him out of his studio, so there was always this push and pull of being in the studio. So to notice sometimes they've just bought a private collection, and that's because people are very discreet in who they want to know and who owns certain pieces of artwork. So I'm surprised and how informative they are and how people know he owns So once said that as an artist, he strove not to be like a craftsman. And by that he meant not perfecting the production of the same kind. Made in 1968, another gift from Musa to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Over and over again. And that's something that Musa. I really think you start to get a sense of in this room. She's the best gift. After the Guggenheim exhibition had opened, his practice begins to shift again as he begins to work even more with just black and white pigments, creating these kind of grey compositions in which these black head-shaped figures begin to emerge or coalesce in the middle. These works were exhibited at the Jewish Museum in New York in 1966, and it was after this that he faces yet another creative crisis alongside a personal one in his marriage with Musa McKim. Amongst this trouble, he moves down to Florida, and there he starts creating uh, what are called the pure drawings, which you can see in this room. At the same time, he's moving back towards figuration, and he's creating what are called the object drawings, which were often just very simple drawings of shoes, cars, and books, which you can see here. And really, there's this internal conflict going on. Should he continue as an abstract painter, or should he move in a figurative direction. In this gallery, we really wanted to get across a sense of where Gusson is heading next and why. You will have noticed an absence of politics in Gusson's art in the 1950s and 60s in the previous rooms, which at this moment comes roaring back. However, during those previous decades, he still maintained a political interest. For example, in the 1960s, he was chair of the Art Committee for Artists for Core, Core being one of the most significant civil rights organizations in the US in the 1960s. And so, in the late 1960s, as he turns to figuration, he's also watching incredibly tumultuous events play out in the US and across the world. Wars, protests, and persecution. It's also a decade where there's a resurgence in interest in the Holocaust, 
not least following the trial of Adolf Eichmann, where philosopher Hannah Arendt coined the phrase, the banality of evil. So I think Gustin is pondering the nature of evil at this time, asking who is capable of committing such acts, wondering if we all are. And at the same time, he starts to ask these questions in his art, and he does so through utilizing the symbol of the infamous hood. Gustin was working for several years on large-scale paintings that included hooded figures. He debuted them in 1970 at a commercial gallery in New York, Marlborough Gallery, which had become famous for promoting the work of abstract expressionist artists. The audience was shocked. His friends were shocked. The critics were shocked at what he was doing. And those works continue to shock today. Something about the way that Gustin utilized a kind of comic language to talk about racial hatred and violence and the things that are embedded in everyday life, it still disturbs. When Gustin talked about what it was like to make these paintings, he imagined himself as a movie director, giving different scenes to a story where hoods are overtaking a city. And he talked about it as a kind of ubiquitous evil, not just the KKK, but the evil that's inside potentially everyone. He was thinking about his own culpability, as well as the complicity in evil acts that we all share. As you look around this gallery, you'll see how in the early 1970s, Gustin moved away from a preoccupation with the hood to a wider world of objects and symbols that he'd adopt for the rest of the decade. Gustin had pre-planned his escape after the Marlborough show with his wife, Musa McKim. Exhibitions always made him very anxious, and both him and his wife, Musa McKim, traveled to Italy just days after the opening. Whilst there, he started to read many of the harsh criticisms that were been written about the Marlborough show, and this really stung him. I remember walking around Trastevere with him, and it was, it was sad. It was with a heavy heart because he felt so attacked. He felt such a victim of anger and hatred and uh, bitterness towards him, which... I think weighed very heavily. He never, you know, he was walking around Rome with us with a cigarette in his mouth as usual, but it felt a bit like one of the characters in his paintings of being very beleaguered and down. In this room, we have various references to Gustin's wife, Musa McKim. She was probably the closest person in helping him figure out what's happening on the canvas and what the latest work might be about. We see her poems, which Gustin also illustrated with his own images in a series of poem pictures. These are one of various collaborations that he made with poets in the mid 1970s. And then we have these veiled references within the strange iconography, that personal iconography of Gustin, where Musa appears over and over again. Overall. I will give this exhibition a 10 out of 10. Very informative. Very just, it's very teaching, showing you how artists can develop in their practice and throughout all the years he's been working, how much he's, his work's changed and his meaning's changed. So I feel like this is definitely an exhibition to come to for emerging artists. 